And so you have to learn to say no to things in order to say yes to yourself. And that's what real spirituality is, is about as the, in the beginning. Welcome to Stand Out, Get Noticed, the podcast that helps you speak and present with rock star confidence. I'm Christina Cantors, your host and founder of The C Method Communication Skills Training. For free resources and to subscribe to the show, visit thecmethod.com. Hi there, rock star. Welcome back to Stand Out, Get Noticed. Christina with you here for episode 172. This week, we're asking some big questions. Why? What is my purpose? Why am I here? And to help me with this, I am so excited to introduce you to Michael Cohan. Now, for those of you wondering, um, Christina, I thought this was a show about communication and speaking and, and being you know, your best at work. Well, as you're about to discover, I mean, I live by this as well. I believe that if I take care of my emotional well-being, my spiritual well-being, my, you know, my physical well-being, then I know that I'm going to be the best that I can be for the people around me and also in my work. So I like to address topics on the show that are more from a well-rounded approach in terms of a holistic wellness approach. And that's why I was so excited to meet Michael and to bring him on the show. So Michael is a certified health coach, a certified life coach and yoga teacher who works with others to help them restore balance in their lives by helping them to make healthier and more conscious lifestyle choices. When we first connected, I had planned to talk about mindfulness, but then it turned into a conversation around spirituality and asking the question, who am I? Why am I here? Michael shared how he went from having a highly stressful corporate job to finding out what he really wanted in life. So, and just for the record, this is not about quitting your job, you know, in order to find happiness. If Michael talks about what you can do in order to ask those questions and to find your purpose without necessarily quitting your job and becoming an entrepreneur, which is what a lot of uh, self-help gurus, um, you know, encourage you to do. So if you're feeling stressed at work, if you're feeling overwhelmed, or maybe you're burnt out. Or maybe you're at a crossroads and not sure what the next step is for you. You must listen to this. It is full of so much gold. And in fact, you should, if you, if you can, take out a pen and paper and take notes because Michael shares a lot of really good um, ideas and, and tips as well that you can implement. But I warn you, Michael will not be giving it to you easy. He shares some harsh harsh truths that you may find confronting. But if you are committed to making big changes in your life, then this is what you need. And, you know, oftentimes the truth is not easy to digest, but that's what we need if we want to um, improve. Show notes for this episode will be at thecmethod.com slash yogi, Y-O-G-I. Okay. Right, before we jump into the conversation, um, do listen to the end to hear a really exciting announcement. If you love this podcast and you want to connect with other podcast listeners, then definitely uh, stay tuned to the end because I have something really exciting to share with you. All right, let's jump into this conversation with Michael Cohan. So my question is, can we dive into mindfulness without a bit of a discussion around spirituality? Is it going to, do we need to provide that context? Well, I think there, that is a debate that is within the academic world of mindfulness, where people that approach mindfulness from a, um, a you know, academic perspective, from Harvard, from Yale, from Cambridge, who study mindfulness, they tend to stay away from the spiritual side of mindfulness, like the monk. And they focus more on mindfulness as a way to be productive in life, to live more in the present moment, to deal with any sort of negative speak and any sort of negative habits. Whereas other people in mindfulness, my background included, we approach it from a more of a spiritual standpoint where it's about being present in the moment, living a healthy life being mindful, but also understanding why we're trying to be present and mindful to live more harmoniously within our life in that connection to that larger sense of consciousness, which has many different names. 
So mindfulness covers many different umbrellas and mind, there's room for everybody to practice mindfulness, whether you're spiritual, whether you're religious, or whether you're just someone who wants to be more effective in work or in life or in their relationship, there's, a, there's room for everybody in the house of mindfulness. All right. Look, I really love how you explained, you know, he touched on the, the why and understanding why we're doing this in the first place. So let's talk about spirituality for a moment and then maybe later we can dive into the mindfulness tools to then further support that, that spirituality. So, Michael, you, I know that you left a very secure but very intense um, corporate job many years ago to do uh-huh. what you're doing now, which is being a full-time health coach and yoga teacher and, and life coach. Was that when you started your, your journey into spirituality? When, when, when did that begin? So my journey into spirituality started when I was, I think, like a sophomore year in, in high school. And um, I was never really the best student in school, but I got good grades. Meaning I was, so I'm 42 years, 42 year old, 42 years old. And so I was an 80s kid in the United States during a period when they didn't really understand people with learning disabilities. And I have what's called acute dyslexia. I have attention deficit hyperactive disorder. And so for me to sit still at a, when I was a kid was very difficult for us, for, excuse me, for me. And what I mean by that was difficult was they, my school system didn't understand what it meant to have ADHD like they do now. So when I was in second grade, my second grade teacher told me I was stupid, that I would never graduate from high school. Along that journey, I proved her wrong and really worked hard and got really good grades. And then my sophomore year of high school, I ended up taking an elective from one teacher that actually believed in me. And I took this sociolo- sociology seminar where we watched this movie and dissected it called Dead Poet Society with Robert Williams. And that's really where my spiritual path began, where Robin Williams talked about in the movie about, you know, living for the moment, seizing the day, being your own individual person, walking your own walk in life, and don't do what other people tell you to do. Don't fall into that trap of this is how you have to live in order to be happy, but rather have the courage to step out of your comfort zone and be able to examine your life and your purpose and say, who am I and what should I do with my life? That is did not happen overnight after that. That was the beginning. And it took me another 15 years to get to the point where I was really into spirituality and mindfulness and becoming the person I am today. So from high school through college, I got what I I followed that traditional path. I got a job. I went to college. I graduated from college. I moved into New York City. I had got a corporate job. I climbed the corporate ladder. I made a lot of money. I had a nice office. I had a brownstone apartment overlooking the park. And I was I had pretty much everything you can possibly want materially in the world. And I looked at myself and said, is that it? I'm like, what's my purpose? I make more money, get more stuff. I already have what I need. This can't be everything. And my friends and family kept saying, well, now is when you get married and have a kid. And I was like, well, I did that once. It didn't work out. (laughs) And so that can't be the answer to find true happiness. So Mm. what am I supposed to do here? I got, I'm making a quarter million dollars a year. I'm 31 years old, which is like, I'm, you know, I'm crushing it. And I just started questioning like what I was meant to do with my life. And that's where it really kind of like, went into like overdrive. And when you say overdrive, what do you, what do you mean by that? I just really got into studying and practicing. So what I mean by studying and practicing, I went from the typical corporate employee who, you know, went to the gym, ran on the treadmill, did some, lifted some weights, worked 70, 80 hours a week, 
and you know went out to every fancy dinner restaurant bar went to the hamptons on the weekends went down to the caribbean for vacation to someone who spent his time outside of work practicing yoga going to meditation classes reading books like the yoga sutras and the bhagavad gita studying meditation techniques with spiritual leaders and and swamis and yoga masters and really trying to figure out what it meant to be a person and what my real purpose in life could be. Because I didn't, it didn't seem right to me that my purpose in life was just to get more stuff. Because I had everything I can possibly want in life, maybe just get a little bit more of the same stuff and acquire more wealth and have a nicer house and get a nicer car and go on nicer vacations. But I still didn't feel like whole. I didn't feel complete. I felt empty. And then I looked at the other people in my office and I looked at people that were like eight, 10 years older than me that were a little bit more successful. They were higher up the food chain. They were had the bigger title. I was on the track to be that person in 10 years. They were all overweight. They were all overworked. They were all old looking. They never saw their wives. They never saw their kids. And I was like, mm. is that my life? Is that what it's going to be? And I, so like, I just started searching and that's yeah. what spirituality is. Spirituality is searching. It's asking the questions of who am I? Why am I here? What's my purpose in life? What am I really meant to do? Am I meant to work this nine to five job or am I meant to do something else? And it's not necessarily saying when, you at, when, you, when you're a spiritual person that you need to quit your job. That's the misconception that I have with a lot of the personal growth gurus and the self-development gurus out there where they're like, quit your job, become an entrepreneur, and then you'll be happy. It's not about that. It's about figuring out what brings you joy in life. So if you're really good at doing math and you love being an accountant, be an accountant. That's, that's your purpose in life. We need accountants. If you're really good at teaching people, become a teacher because we need teachers. If you're really good at motivation and being a leader and telling people and leading by an example, become a corporate executive. If you're really good at your hands and you like fixing things, go work in a trade. It's not about the stuff that's going to bring us fulfillment, but rather understanding our purpose, why mm. we're here. So I have a I have a friend at the moment who has left it was in a similar position to you and has left a, a very stressful but highly paying job and he's at these crossroads and he's not quite sure what he wants to do. He's like, do I go volunteer at the soup van? Do I go to India for a month and cut myself completely off? What would you say to someone who is just feeling who just has no idea, no idea what what direction to take? Look, everybody, if you have the opportunity in your life and you have the financial resources to go to India or go somewhere where you can cut yourself off from the world for a couple of months and take the time to really figure out what you want to do with your life and you have the financial wherewithal, do it. Go for it. What are you going to what are you going to lose? Like life is short, but also life is very long. So, go for it. It's it's not about doing something in terms of like, oh, I don't, I, I'm in this highly stressful job. I don't really like it. So I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to go to India for a month. I'm going to practice some yoga. I'm going to meditate. And then I'm going to open up my own business. Because if you become an entrepreneur like you and like me, it's eight, it's 902 in New Jersey as I'm on this podcast. And I've been working since seven o'clock this morning. I've been teaching yoga. I've been coaching clients. I've been posting my own podcast. I've been working on my blog, organizing my teacher training for next year's yoga teacher training that I'm running, working on a yoga retreat. I mean, so I, I'm working 12, 15, 18 hour days, but I'm not stressed because I'm doing what I'm meant to do. I'm meant to be a yoga teacher. I'm meant to be a, a life coach. I'm meant to be on this radio show talking to you. So when you are at that crossroad and you're in a job that's highly stressful and you're making a lot of money, but you feel highly stressed, it's because you're not doing what you want to do with your life. You're just doing what you do to get stuff, to get the TV that you don't need, to get the house that you don't need, to get the car you don't need, to go on the vacations that you can't afford just for the sake because you think that's what you're supposed to do in life. Because everybody around you has told you your whole life to be successful, you have to work really hard, 
earn a lot of money and get a lot of things. And so when you choose to leave your job like your friend's doing, you have to come to the terms with the fact that you're going to have to get rid of the stuff that you don't need if you want to live that simpler life that, quote unquote, is less stressful. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we've so we're starting to ask the question why and t- starting to pay attention to, okay, why am I doing this? Why, you know, why am I feeling stressed all the time? Is this, maybe this isn't what I'm meant to be doing now. How can someone, and maybe you can share your own story of what you started to do. If someone is still working in a very stressful job, but they're starting to um, create, you go on this spiritual journey of, of asking the question why, what are some things that people can start to do, you know, on a daily basis but you know, are there? Is this where maybe we move into the into the mindful living part of the conversation? Is this something that people can start to incorporate? So, mindfulness is a, is a tool that will help you understand how to live your life in balance more. So, in the Yoga Sutras, which is the guidebook to yoga, and a lot of my life coaching comes from the Yoga Sutras. One of the teachings says is about what's called Abhi Graha which translates as not being greedy. So if you are in a highly stressful job and you are overworked, it's because you have too much stuff in your life because you have to work really hard to keep the stuff. So mindfulness and the practice of mindfulness is beginning to understand why you're overstressed at your job. So you can make a good living. There are plenty of people out there. I have life coaching friends. I have entrepreneur friends who make a very good living and they're able to have a nice house and a nice car and they go on vacations. It's just about choices. So they choose to live a different lifestyle than what you're told to live. And it starts when you're a little kid. So I'm going to back up a little bit before we get into the whole mindfulness. Sure. You're told at a very early age through your school that you go to, I don't care where you live in the world now, you're told wherever you are in any sort of public or private school that your purpose in life is to get good grades, work really hard to get a good job. That's why you're in school. And that's that's not what school, that's a part of school. But unfortunately, school now it does not go around and say, well, how should you live? And what should you do to live a better life as a person? And so Mm. when at an early age, you are already programmed to just think that in order to be happy, in order to do well in life, you just have to work really hard and you'll be happy. And so the beginning of that journey where you sit there and you come to that crossroad and it's going to happen with everybody at different points in their life happens when you're in your 20s. It happens when you're in your 30s, it happens when you're 40s, your 50s, and your 60s. Different points in your life, something is going to come up, then it's going to cause you to look at your life. It's going to be either a, a milestone in your life, like you're getting married, or you're going to have a kid, or it's, you're going to go through some hardship, like a loss of your family, like your parents are passing, or you get divorced, or you get sick due to living an unhealthy lifestyle, or you lose your job. There's going to be some reason that causes you to look at your life. And what happens is most people just skip right over it. They don't stop and pause and go, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? So when you get that moment when you're at that crossroad and you're listening to this podcast, you're coming home from your work and you're overwhelmed and you're tired and you walk into the house and you see your partner and all you want to do is lash out because you're tired and frustrated with your life. That's when it's the time for you to begin to figure out ways to slow down. And that's what mindfulness is about. It's about mm-hmm. teaching the tools to slow down down to take those pauses it can be as simple as before you get out of that car and walk into the house you sit in your car with the radio off and you sit there with your eyes closed and you breathe for a couple minutes or it's a simple act that before you leave your house in the morning before you get up before you get the kids ready for school or you go off to work or you turn on the television you get up in the morning You make your cup of tea or you make your cup of coffee and you sit down and you just read a book 
for you to sit there and just enjoy the morning for a few minutes before you start your day. And that's literally where mindfulness starts. That is as simple as you can get. Michael and I started talking about morning routines and why they're so important for us to create more space in our life, to listen to ourselves and find out what we really want. Now, Mike, Michael does yoga every morning, but he has some suggestions for alternatives you can do if you're not into yoga. There is a great book that's all about high performance and living a high performance life that every success guru, CEO swears by, and it's The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod. So you either can go into yoga or you can read his book, and both teachings will tell you you get up in the morning and you it doesn't have to be an hour. It could be 15 minutes, but you take 15 minutes for your personal well-being first thing in the morning. You act, you move your body. You do some stretching. You meditate. You just sit in silence. You, you journal. You read. You just do stuff that's going to make you a better person, better human being first thing in the morning to start your day. And that way, the rest of the day is a little bit easier instead of just getting up and going. And I don't care who you are. You have the time. I don't care if you have 10 kids, you have the time. It's just choices. It means that you have to get, you just don't go to, you just don't watch TV or you don't go on social media at, at the end of the day, or you leave work a little earlier if you need to. It's all about choices in life. And when you say no to yourself, it's not going to help anybody else. And so you have to learn to say no to things in order to say yes to yourself. And that's what real spirituality is, is, is about as the, in the beginning. It's about saying yes to you and your well-being and how you can be a healthy person, a healthy human being. Mm, I love that. I swear by a morning routine and um, I make it, a, well, when the sun's rising anyway, a bit earlier, I'll, you know, go for a walk along the beach and it just helps me to feel really calm for the rest of the day. Yeah. Um, I totally, I totally understand how, like, if you just get up and go, I, I mean, I just feel frazzled for the rest of the day and I can't, like, I just don't feel right. Yeah. My, my body hurts. My, I, I, I'm stressed. I'm overwhelmed. I'm easily in a fight. Um, I'll argue with people. I'm just, and I just don't do as well at work. And I just are not, I'm just not as productive unless I get up in the morning and do things for myself first thing. I just take an hour to do my personal miracle morning, my sod into practice, and then my life is so much better. Um, and would that's you, Would like, you mind sharing, sorry, would you mind sharing your part of your routine? I could share my routine very easily. So my routine is um, about an hour and an hour before I have to leave or an hour and a half, depending on the day before I have to do any other responsibilities, I get up and I make sure that it's eight hours of sleep before I get up. So the night before I go to bed, if I'm going to get up at 6 a.m., I'm my lights are out at 10 p.m. Now, we have a rule that we don't watch TV during the week. We don't go on our cell phones. We read before bed as a way to help calm ourselves down before we go to bed. Now, some days when I'm tired and I'm off and I'm not at my best, I do watch TV, which makes it harder to get through the week. So that's why we try not to watch TV at all during the week. I get up in the morning. First thing I do is I make a cup of coffee and then I sit down and I read a book that's going to make that I read either a spiritual book on yoga or I read a personal development book on like developing highly leadership skills or being a productive person. And the first thing I do in the morning is I read for about 20 minutes to a half hour, because as everybody knows, if you want to be a leader, you read. That's just the truth. After I read for a half hour, I do a yoga practice, a yoga routine that takes me about 10 minutes. Then I move my body. I do what's called like a dance routine where I move my joints and my muscles. And then after that, I do different body cleansing practices, which are called kriyas, where I, I pump my belly to massage my organs. And then I do some breath work, which is called pranayama. Then I meditate. And then my partner and I, we read our morning mission statement about who we are as people. And then we read sacred texts like the Yoga Sutras and the Bhagavad Gita. 
And that's my morning routine. And it takes about an hour, hour and a half on a bad day. If I'm really slow, it'll take me about an hour and a half. But I can do it in an hour. Wow. That's awesome. I love it. That's so good. How how often would you say, like, what proportion of the time do you do you hit that every morning? I'm in the like, last... Like, what's a good week? Yeah. In the <laughs> last three weeks, I missed last Wednesday. So, like, a lot of times people come up to me, and when I'm working with them as a life coach, I, the, one of the first things I start tackling is the morning routine. And I hear nine times out of ten, I'm just not a morning person. I'm a night owl. And I'm like, mm. that's just not true. Because your body doesn't know the difference between morning and night. The body doesn't know to go, oh, it's 11 o'clock at night. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be awake. The body doesn't know. It's the mind. And the mind's distracted by things like Facebook, social media, television, TV. These are all things that are designed to keep you awake so you will watch it longer. The light on your cell phone, the colors of the, te- the color spectrum on your TV, the color spectrum on your computer, they're all designed to look pretty and to keep you stimulated to stay on for a longer period of time. So the only reason why you're awake at night and you think you're a night owl is because you're plugged into your devices. So the first thing I do is I talk to my clients about taking the devices and turning them off two hours before bed. Yes. I can't emphasize enough how amazing it is when you turn off the TV. It's so easy to get into that habit of you come home from work, TV goes on because you want to just flake out on the couch and not sort of focus on anything. But from experience, I know how amazing it is to just not have the TV on. It's amazing the conversations you have with the people in your house. You know, it forces you to look at other things. And Well, how about having the conversation with the self? One of the main reasons why yeah. people walk in come, when they get home from work and the first thing they do is they turn on the TV and more times than not, they turn on the news because they don't want to deal with the thoughts in their mind. See, it's very easy in life. It's 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 very easy to sit there and say to the world, it's everybody else's pro- fault that I have the problems I have today. It's the people that don't look like me or it's the people that don't believe in me or it's the people in power that run the country I live in, that they're the ones screwing up my life or it's my ex-partner who screwed me out of this. That's the reason why I'm in my situation. Nobody wants to take responsibility for the problems that they're dealing with. And the only person that only person's fault of whatever you're going through in life is yours. And the first thing you have to do with the spiritual as a spiritual being is take responsibility for your life. If you're in financial debt, it's your fault. It's not the government's. If you don't like your job, it's not your it's not your wife or husband who's forcing you to go get the job. It's your fault because you have bought the things in life you can't afford. If you're out of shape and you're you have some sort of health issue like diabetes or cancer, it's your fault because you're not taking care of yourself. Now that's harsh because sometimes we do have things in life that are out of our control. Sometimes we have genetic precursors that we get sort of diseases that we can't deal with. So if you're going through that, that's a separate situation. I'm talking about lifestyle ailments. And if whatever problems you have based on your lifestyle, the only person that can fix it is you and you have to take responsibility for your life. And that's why when people come home, they want to turn on the TV because they don't want to deal with their problems. They don't want to deal with the wife that they have trouble connecting with or the husband that they don't see anymore, or they don't want to have, they don't want to face the kids that are out of control. They just want to tune them out by putting them in front of the TV or face the financial problems of climbing out of financial debt because one day they woke up and they were like, whoa, how did I get this $10,000 credit card debt? Or I have type two back diabetes because all I do is eat fast food or the countless other problems. And But here's the thing. Everybody in the world has these problems. None of us are different. I've met very advanced spiritual seekers, swamis, Dalai Lama, His Holiness Radha Swami. I've met major financial gurus that make you know $100 million a year. I used to work for them. I've met beautiful powerful, intelligent life coaches. I've met, I've met professional athletes and famous rock stars and musicians and actors. And every person, I don't care who you are, has problems. And the quality of your life 
determines not if you ignore your problems, but rather if you look at your problems and say, how can I deal with these problems and make myself better and take these problems and use them as my teacher in life instead of suffering? Because we're all going to have that pain. We're going to always have that hardship. But we have a choice whether to sit there with suffering and blame it on others or take that and say, here's this pain I'm going through and I'm going to turn my life around. I'm going to deal with this problem and I'm going to become a better person because of it. Love it. Wonderfully said, Michael. And I appreciate you being candid and being harsh because you know, I think that's that's what people need to hear in order to make uh, some radical change in their life if that's what they need to do. So, Michael, I know that you help people with this. You help people to develop, you know, healthier habits and and stronger um, mindful practices into their lives and help them find their purpose. You know, if people want to reach out to you and and learn more from you and, and your teachings, can you give us a uh, an overview as to, you know, who you work with and where can they find you? Um, you know, I wish I said I had an avatar, but every time I come across someone <laughs> who works with me, I'm always amazed that they want to work with me. So people come from many different walks of life. I work with, you know, financial gurus and I work with stay at home moms and I work with millennials struggling with adult life and I work with regular people just trying to live a better life. Most people that I work with, though, are spiritual, but not religious. They're into meditation, they're into either Tai Chi or yoga or like, you know, Zen running or hiking or in the woods and they're, they make a good living or they're in, they're at a point in their life where they're just at a crossroad and they just need some help making better, like figuring out that crossroad in in life, whether it's, they want to lose some weight or they're struggling with a career change or they're trying to figure out how to be a better person in life with their partner and their family, or they're just trying to figure out how to get started in life. So it's usually people that are spiritual, not religious, and at some sort of crossroad. You can find me at my website at yourwellnessyogi.com, or you can find me on my podcast at the Living Life on Purpose show. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Michael. And thanks for thanks for staying up late and sacrificing your early bedtime for this podcast. I really oh, my pleasure. <laughs> I, I'm grateful to be here and thank you for having you on, me on. And, you know, I hope uh, I gave some good knowledge for your audience to get them started. And, you know, any fi- my final tip is guys, girls, women, men, if you want to get started, just get up in the morning, sit down on a, your couch And just close your eyes and breathe for one minute and try doing that for 30 days and see how much of a difference it's going to make. One minute, 30 days, just breathing with your eyes closed before you do anything else. And you'll be amazed at how different your life is. Beautiful. Thanks again, Michael. Thank you. Big thanks to Michael Cohan for being such a wonderful guest on the show this week. I just loved his honesty and his willingness to share um, around his own journey and also how he helps his clients as well. You can find out more about what he does at yourwellnessyogi.com or simply visit the show notes at thecmethod.com slash yogi. Now, before you switch off, I would like you to think about one thing that you're going to implement that you heard from this conversation. Maybe it's simple, as simple as sitting on the couch and breathing, or maybe you go and read The Miracle Morning, or maybe you make an effort to turn the TV off. Pick one thing, or you might want to re-listen to this podcast and take some notes to further cement what you've learned. I, I suggest if you do one thing, it's, it's going to be easier to implement than a whole lot of different things at once. So just implement one thing. And, and like Michael said, see you know, do one thing every day for 30 days and see what difference that makes in your life. Okay, it's time for the announcement that I mentioned at the top of this episode. You've all been so patiently waiting. I have started a Facebook group. Yes, this is for listeners of this podcast and for people who have attended my workshops, essentially people who are familiar with the C-Method approach to you know, professional development, speaking, communication, and people who are committed to their personal and professional development and who want to connect with other like-minded individuals in a supportive community. This podcast has grown so much and I feel like 
there's listeners all over the world and you all write to me and message me on different platforms and I just want to bring you all together so that you can meet each other because you're also awesome. So the Facebook group will be a place for you to um, connect with other podcast listeners and also be in a safe space where you can share your challenges and your wins or perhaps ask for feedback. Um, Maybe you want to share a video introducing yourself. Maybe you want to practice um, a speech or speaking to camera. You know, any of these challenges that you want to, you know, um, put forward to yourself, but maybe you're a bit afraid to put it out there onto your, you know, your personal social profiles or maybe um, at work you don't feel comfortable in that environment. This will be a, a safe environment for you to do that. Not to mention you'll get direct access to me because I'm going to be in the group, of course, and I'll be uh, posting Facebook live videos and sharing additional um, tips and ideas and challenges for for people that are not uh, on this podcast as well. So I'm really excited about the Facebook group and I would love to invite you to join us. Um, I think it will be really a really wonderful um, resource and community. Um, I haven't actually finalized a name yet because I thought I might ask the people in the group to give feedback as to what they think it should be called. But for the time being, I'm calling it the C Method Rockstars because that's what you are. So if you, I'll put a link in the description of this podcast to the Facebook group for you to join. And I'll also pop it in the show notes at thecmethod.com slash yogi. Otherwise, go to Facebook and search for the C Method Rockstars. I look forward to seeing you in the group. It's going to be amazing. Okay, and that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today and listening all the way to the end. You are amazing. Keep on being awesome and I will talk to you next week. My name's Christina Cantors and this has been Stand Out, Get Noticed. Thank you for listening to Stand Out, Get Noticed. To learn more and inquire about the C-Method coaching, keynote and corporate training programs, visit thecmethod.com.